Love this podcast? Support this show through the Acast Supporter feature. It's up to you how much you give and there's no regular commitment. Just hit the link in the show description to support now. This is the Apollo Audio Podcast. Welcome to the Apollo Audio Podcast. Hello. Hello. Hey. That's no, not even a cheer this week. So hey. I'm slightly hung over this week. I, I can slightly tell. Miles, <laughs> Miles just basically just went... Right. Now, normally you've got, you've got you're, you're the sort of enthusiast. Nirvana, Nirvana's woke me up, believe you me. Okay, cool. We'll get there. This is the Apollo Audio Podcast, where we discuss the uh, top 500 albums ever, as listed by Rolling Stone magazine from 2020. Two albums every week and uh, deciding what we basically think of them. It's two albums to listen to a week. Feels like a lot sometimes. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's not a lot. Feels mm. like a lot sometimes. Before we begin, a couple of things that I just want to sort of clear up from last week because we were talking about Bob Marley and the Whalers and we talked about things like Island Records. Um, was this their sort of uh, initial breakthrough with Bob Marley Mailers. I, I thought I'd better check that out because I feel like I don't want to be completely off, off the wall with this. So I thought I'd set the record straight. Island Records was actually begun in 1959 and had made a significant number of releases prior to Bob Marley and the Whalers and had released artists including Cat Stevens, Fairport Convention and Roxy Music, mm. for example. So they were by no means an unknown mm. quantity by the time they were um, releasing that album. Uh, they also released Funky Kingston, uh, Island Records actually released that and as reggae chronology that we're talking about like who came first it was actually released before Catch a Fire ah. so it did come out beforehand but it uh, didn't it wasn't as popular and didn't catch on really until 1975 when it was re-released in America and that's what's kind of given it its uh, okay. classic album status as a 1975 revised version of it basically but yeah I thought we should sort of clear that up that actually it was Toots and the Maytales predated this album. Oh, yeah, oh, cool. Fair. Um, I think I prefer that the, one. Uh, the Whalers, the, the, the idea about whether it was Bob Marley and the Whalers and the Whalers and what happened to them, the Whalers disbanded in 1974, but Bob Marley continued performing as Bob Marley and the Whalers, but with a completely new backing band. The other members of the original Whalers went on to solo careers and also performed separately as the Whalers or the Whalers Band. Several of the group's members have died subsequent to Marley's death in 1981, Three of them were murdered. Fuck. Really? Yeah. What? <laughs> Only five in the band. Yeah, three of them were murdered. Uh, Carlton Barrett and Peter Tosh were both murdered in 1987, and Junior Braithwaite was murdered in 1999. Well, <sighs> I don't know the reason for that. <clears throat> anyway, I just thought I'd sort of uh, <laughs> do some do some corrections mm. oh, or yeah. some updates from our previous episode. There you go. This week, uh, as always, two albums then. We had uh, Tom Petty and Nirvana. Uh, only a year apart, these two, actually, which was uh, interesting, perhaps. Do you want to hear the link? I've got a... a uh... I can't wait to hear it. <laughs> Do you want to hear the link? Yeah. I didn't know I heard a bit of Wildflowers, but I think I've told you to watch this documentary. Um, the Foo Fighters documentary called Back and Forth. It's all about yeah. Dave Grohl from Nirvana up until their album Wasting Light. Uh-huh. And after... Um, Obviously, Kurt Cobain died. Um, Tom Petty asked uh, Dave Grohl to be their full-time drummer. He did, didn't he? Yeah. And there's a clip on that a film of him playing Saturday Night Live That's on right, the yeah. drums. Yeah, he did. Because so, I, I just read Dave Grohl's book, yeah. uh, Storyteller, yeah. and he talks about that because he'd, he'd, he'd been asked to play drums for yeah. Tom Petty and the yeah. Heartbreakers. were like, yeah. really? Yeah. Uh, and then they asked him to join the band. Yeah. And he was yeah. like, I don't feel like I want to join Tom no. Petty in the Heartbreakers. Well, what is such a big... <laughs> Different. <laughs> yeah, but it's such a big, like, Foo Fighters are nothing at the time. It was li- the first Foo Fighters album was literally just yeah. Dave Grohl. And it's so, t- they were saying, so, it was massive at the time, wasn't it? Probably one of the biggest I was going to say, he said he didn't want to join Tom Petty. That was no disrespect yeah. to Tom Petty. No. He didn't feel he was worthy, almost, mm. of being in mm. Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers. Plus, he wanted to work on yeah. his own stuff. Yeah. But it wasn't any kind of diss on them yeah. at all. Mm. No. Yeah. But that's the link. Yeah, nice one. Good link for that. You're absolutely right. And I read the bloody book recently. <laughs> Good link. Uh, yeah, so Tom Petty and Nirvana, uh, much more closely linked than I'd, than I'd considered. But let's start uh, in traditional form with the one that is lower down, a higher number, Miles, on the list. <laughs> so we'll start with number My lips are 214, sealed. which was Wildflowers, released on 1st of November 1994. Do you want to hear the Rolling Stone blurb? On Please. This? 
Tom Petty had struggled for two years to make the Rick Rubin produced follow up to 1989's hit Full Moon Fever. He ha- had left tons of songs in the can and the final product stretched to 70 minutes but didn't have any filler. Petty hit a new songwriting <laughs> peak going from intimate, soul-bearing songs like the title track and Crawling Back to You to rockers like You Wreck Me and House in the Woods. I think this is maybe the favourite LP I've ever done, said Tom Petty. Of course it's uh, this. Mm. Well, they always say that, don't they? I always do. What, when did he say that? <laughs> like, if he said it straight after, it's like, you always say that. Yeah. <laughs> if he's still saying it now, maybe mm. different. Uh, this was his second solo studio album, obviously not with the Heartbreakers. Produced by Rick Rubin, the album actually features all members of Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers, with the exception of the drummer. Uh, drums are played by Steve Ferroni uh, on this, and he joined the band officially the next year. However, the album was not credited to the Heartbreakers because Tom Petty said, Rick and I both wanted more freedom than to be strapped into five guys. Strapped into five guys, <laughs> there's a thought. Uh, November 1994, the number one movie was Stargate. The number one album was Crossroad, the best of Bon Jovi. Uh, UK number one, I want to say short album, but that would be rude. Uh, UK number one (laughs) single was Baby Come Back by Pat O'Banton. Tune. Baby Come Back. Yeah, that's a cover, isn't it? Loads of people have covered that. Baby Come Back. Eddie Grant, I think, did that originally. I remember thinking, we're thinking of two different songs, I think. Oh, maybe. Baby Come Back. Baby, come back because I'm on my best behaviour. Maybe that Oh, one. maybe I'm getting it mixed up. And then the other one by Player. Baby, come back. You can give it all. Oh, Sounds me. like there's a lot of songs called Baby, come, <laughs> yeah. Baby, come back. Lisa Stansfield's <laughs> covered it loads, yeah, yeah. On November the 3rd, 1994, the first PlayStation console was released by Sony. On November the 13th, Sweden agreed to join the European Union. And on November the 14th, the first public trains run in the Channel Tunnel. Wow. Oh. What all year? these things would be long, longer ago, mm. wouldn't you? That's all 1994. Mm. The thing that surprised me most about that is the fact that Rick Rubin's done it. I thought he did like the heavier stuff or like the hip hopier stuff. Mm. I couldn't see him doing yeah. this sort of album. Yeah, I think mm. sorry, it's briefly touched on, on that uh, in a conversation last week when we were thinking about these albums. Interesting to see how many credits producers have on this list. Rick Rubin's got to be up there, hasn't he? He's already had bands. three. He's already Beastie Boys. Boys. Last week with him. Yeah, Red Hot Chili Boys. Peppers. Oh, the Beastie Boys one that he produced that we haven't actually covered oh, what okay. we did talk about. But yeah, this is his second production credit, yeah. I think, from the albums that we've covered already. Yeah. Well, um, he's done some of my favorite albums. He did a lot of like, heavy stuff. He's done like System of Downs, obviously on Chili Peppers, yeah. stuff like that. So I, I can't yeah. see him doing this sort of stuff. Yeah, it does seem slightly... Funny you say off. that, though, because I was listening to it in the car and um, Nicole thought some of the songs we were in the car together, she was like... Is this the Chili Peppers? I was like, no, it's Tom Petty. Oh, really? I was like, that's quite a weird link, isn't it? Yeah. But then you said that, maybe the... Because yeah. he produced both, maybe there is some sort of... I couldn't, it wasn't very hip hop though, was it? No. I was like, I can't remember what song it was, but she thought, and, you know, she knows her music well, and she was like, sounds like the Chili Peppers. I turned it up and yeah. it was quite obviously Tom <laughs> Petty. <laughs> <laughs> At that point. <laughs> oh, yes. Now I see. So, you want to throw in a discourse? Go on, Martin, you go first. <laughs> uh, <laughs> okay. Shall I read what I wrote down when I listened to this first time? Cool. This is negative, I can feel yeah. it. <laughs> first thing I said was, there's clearly more than a nodding reference and influence to Bob Dylan here. Yeah. As he's, he's vocalising, definitely very Dylan-esque. Uh, and then I said, I wonder if this is because of the Travelling Wilburys, because we're working with Bob Dylan during the Travelling Wilburys prior to doing this with George Harrison, Bob Dylan. Oh, cool. Um, so I thought, I wonder if his earlier work sounds as influenced by Bob Dylan or mm. whether he's kind of picked up a lot of that sort yeah. of cadence from working directly <laughs> with him. I don't know. This is what I wrote specifically, exactly as I've written it here, because I thought, what the hell? How I feel after the first three songs. <laughs> <laughs> Boring, average, white American soft rock. Mm. Pretty joyless, dreary and trudging. Pointless guitar solo parts, disassociated harmonica uh, parts. Monica, yeah. If I'd produced this, I'd be disappointed. <laughs> <laughs> Can you imagine seeing this play live? You'd be asleep within 10 minutes. Everything sounds totally functional. I don't like the songs, I don't like the arrangements, and I don't like the production. Ouch. But that was after three songs. After Ouch. four, I wrote, this is better. Oh, it's a co-write. <laughs> <laughs> Track five, it's good to be king. I much prefer the arrangement on this. The strings and the backing vocals actually provide some interest and the chord progressions have started to develop a little bit. After that, I've written, yeah, it all improves, but I still find the drum tracks in particular very pedestrian. Yeah, so much. Because I was expecting so much more. Because obviously yeah. what I knew about it was Dave Grohl playing on it. Yeah. 
and I, I just assumed he did the album. Yeah. And that song that I heard, that Honeybee one, where it was called, it's so laid back and he gives it so much more when you see Dave Grohl play it yeah. compared to this one. It's just so... Yeah, it's Steve Ferroni, who's like, uh, he, he played with the, I think his original band was the Average White Band. Yeah. Um, and he's a huge session drummer. He's mm. been on everything. Yeah. Like loads of stuff. So I thought, yeah, this is really odd that this just sounds... Mm. Everything sounds really plodding, but you do get that, and that's what I'm not, not that it's soft rock, but like ACDC or stuff. It's just like boom, da. and you get um, what's it called, Sugarfoot from like Michael, Michael Jackson stuff. He does all his stuff. Mm, yeah. It's all Billy Jean's just like bass snare, but sometimes it works. Yeah, so yeah. Sometimes it needs it. Yeah, for more like disco. This is just like you want to give it a little bit more. Yeah, because there's more going on, and also yeah. with disco, the BPMs are normally yeah, you know, faster. Yeah. And the arrangements more, the are more interesting. More going, the vocals yeah. are more developed. More going on. This is <laughs> like, I don't know. It's, yeah. it's not just. It wasn't just. It just sounded so plodding. And I think part of that was maybe the tempo. I think yeah. it's the genre though, like soft rock. It's because we're born. The thing is, like, it's all ballady in it. It's yeah. just like, to hear him say that quote is just that's a, just a classic case. I think of somebody who knows it's not. Um, yeah, that is no way. That for me, I can't see how anyone thinks that's better than Full Moon Fever. It's not that I know it overly well, but I know, you know, free falling and won't yeah. back down and like the hits. And that's just like, it's a different league. Yeah, I mean, me. that, that surprised me as well. That I literally, like, there's hits on this apparently. And I was like, well, I haven't heard you of You wouldn't, yeah, 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 yeah. Mm. Um, I didn't know any of them. Nothing on this sounded familiar. He's a bit of a legend, isn't he? So it's like singer songwriters. People, you know, he's seen as a sort of like one of the pioneers of that sort of folky, country, bluesy sort of. Yeah, thing, I, thing I, that I hate. Yeah, no. I mean, I did. I did think. <laughs> of you. I was thinking, like is, it, is it part? Is it in that um, arena of the stuff that you've already said? I just don't like. Mm. Um, I expected to like it more because I said I've, I know I know those songs like, uh, like you said, Free Falling, American Girl. You know those ones that well, are hits. You go, oh yeah, <coughs> Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers. I know yeah. some of those songs. I'm sure I like that sort of stuff. And then I listened to this album and I was like. Jesus. Sorry, where was it again? What number on the list was this? 214. This is the height. I was just checking yeah, as you were can't. talking. I was looking this up. This is uh, 200 and... Is it 214? Yeah, 214. But this is the highest rated Tom Petty album. What? On the 500 list. So just, you're saying Full Moon Fever. That's the lowest rated one. That's 298. That's so much better. Um, and that and was... Damn the out... Torpedoes is the other one at 231. Wasn't this Full Moon Fever? That, that, that was... That was commer that that commercially did better as well than this. Yeah, I mean, I and why, was... why, it's why it's rated. The way people have described this album, even that Rolling Stone thing, says this is his best collection of songs. I'm like, blimey, who? What were you thinking when you were listening to this? Is it a period of time? Is it mm. is it an American it versus does sound UK so Ameri thing? So American, isn't it? Is yeah. it a Rolling Stone thing? Is it you know a, you know, a white white American rock thing? Because it just it just sounded so bland it's to me. But it's, it's 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 ploddy. It's boring and it's very samey. Even the chord sequences were like. You know, I, do you know a guy called Rick Beato? Does yeah, yeah, yeah. On, uh, uh, he does occasionally. He does the sort of what makes the song great. Yes. He does rundowns of the Spotify mm. top 10 and sort of says, you know, modern music is just, it's the same chord progression, the same <laughs> trap beats, mm. the same stuff. And I was listening to this album and going, surely you could rip this apart. It's, mm. it's got very standard chord progressions. Mm. It's acoustic guitar. Maybe that's why it's, you know, I can impress the girls because I can pick up my acoustic guitar and I can play a Tom Petty song mm. in the corner so easily. Because mm. I was thinking, I can't play the guitar at all. And I was thinking, I'm pretty sure I could play this. Yeah. <laughs> and when they do bring like the guitar parts, they just milk it for ages. I don't know if it's just like a bluesy thing when you go around the same like sort of... Songs were really long yeah, as well, yeah. I yeah. That, yeah. Even, I just... the, even the ones that I liked... I was like, yeah, please stop. Yeah. I always think, I don't know if it's just me coming from a songwriting's point of view, but I always think you should leave them wanting more. Like, yeah. if you like it that much, you listen to it again. Yeah. You don't need to do something 84 times because no. it's good. I think yeah. he's seen as a very emotional singer and, and, and he puts a lot of, uh, you know, he's seen as like a few singing big love anthems. And I didn't but, even get that from this Well, no, song. this was... I, like, I think you're right. That's what I thought. This is what I was about to say, but this one was almost a bit like... A, like bitter and regret and quite uh, depressing to listen to. It was quite, uh, well, you know, it just sounds disinterested. Just, just I was quite thought. excited for this because I like Tom Petty. But yeah, when you actually look at this album as a, as a piece of work, you're like, this isn't, I'm with you, Martin. I, I didn't, didn't, didn't think it was great. I'm enjoying my own rant about this too much. <laughs> I didn't think what, it was uh, great, Controversial but... point. What, uh, <laughs> what cover do you prefer? The John Mayer version of Free Fallen or his version? That's a tough question. I've probably heard the John Mayer one more. But I don't know. I can't answer. John Mayer, it's actually banger. It's that live yeah. album's unreal. That should be on the list. I don't know. 
the uh, I don't know the John Muir version. What? Oh, so oh, nice. good. It's really good on the electric. It's beautiful. Yeah. It's funny because I do the edits on these, obviously, listen back to the sh- to the recordings that we've done on previous shows. And I think, Miles, you were saying about... Oh, no, it's Billy. I think you were saying you've got, to, you've got to give these albums at least... You know, listen to them a couple of times mm. to give them a fair run of the... Run of the... Run of the whatever. What's that mm. phrase? Mill. Run, run of the, the mill. mill? No, mm. that's no. not right. <laughs> that's whatever it is. Run in the park. <laughs> run it, to give them a fair run in the park. <laughs> yeah, I got it. And I had that in mind whilst I was because I thought I just didn't like this when mm. I first listened to it. Mm. Maybe I was in the wrong mood. Mm. So I gave it another listen. And uh, it didn't annoy me as much second time yeah. around. No. But having said that, when I when I was listening to it first time, I wrote about only a broken heart. I said, Oh, the vocal production I quite like on this, but it's a bit too George Harrison Beatley. Mm. Um what well, for you? I, yeah, <laughs> Crash, yeah. And it's, got, and it's and George Harrison again. He'd worked with on the traveling. Mill. Actually, I was thinking. Oh, I, I I thought I'd thought differently. No, I didn't. I've written the same thing. Only a broken heart. Interesting vocal production. And I'd read that far and thought, oh, I must have liked it more. But then I've written also a bit to George Harrison Beatley. It's even got a Mellotron. It's still boring though. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> and just like too long. The tracks I preferred were the ones with that had a bit more guts to them the ones with the uh, electric guitars yeah you know sort of cut out more of the acoustic stuff like that just sounds so and even, they've had a bit more beans but they were still even the but, harmonica felt quite like like overly manufactured yeah. and just like let's put a harmonica on it that's but then exactly like, what I thought it just sounds stuck on yeah yeah, the yeah. Electric, like, well, I've got a harmonica I'd better play it yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. Sort of the electric guitar ones like oh, you've heard that song a million times before though there's nothing yeah. new that has been done yeah I actually the one I like the most is the first one I didn't mind that first one, but then as it got on, it got more like Dylan-y. Who, who else do we have a couple of weeks ago? It's all in the same sort of... Yeah, Dylan. Uh, yeah. Van Morrison. But, oh, yeah. That sort of, but it's been there for the last like, few weeks, it's been that sort of like... Middle of the road. Very Americana, very American sort yeah. of like soft, rocky stuff. But this is and 20 was, years later. This is 94. Yeah. Those albums you were talking about were <laughs> yeah. set 19... Oh, no, like, I, I much prefer this. The Grateful Dead. The, uh, I, was, I much prefer this to those. I think I prefer Tom Petty <laughs> as a... As an artist, then this album, if that makes sense, I think mm. actually this this I was quite excited for this. I think when you said it's Tom Petty, we go nice. Yeah. But I remember we all went, oh cool, Tom Petty. Like he's seen mm. as like a you know who like James Bay and Ed Sheeran and stuff mm. all talk about Tom Petty like yeah. being being a, a hero in that yeah, great, songwriter, great songwriter pour, or, pours his yeah. heart out on stage. You know, almost like yeah. Um, I think it's probably the most disappointed I've been listening to an album because I had higher expectations. I thought I would. Like I said, Tom Petty, highly regarded, great songwriter. I know some songs that I like, so I thought, well, if it's kind of more than that or better, and this is one of his best albums, supposedly. Did but it annoy you? Did it actually it actively, it actively it? annoyed me how bad it was. Uh, now so I thought it was just... Like I said, just, I, like I said if I'd done this, I'd have been disappointed. I think it was just all right. It now you're just being petty. Yeah. yeah nice. Oh. <laughs> how long have you been saving that one? Yeah. <laughs> that came straight in the air. Probably should have stayed there. <laughs> if only I, had, I might have to put a round of applause in yeah. there. There's a, drum, there's a drum kit over there if anyone wants to give me a... <laughs> it was just crickets in the background. Haystack. Um, no, I think I keep thinking about listening back to this. I think, you know, there's been albums I've not liked on this, uh, what we've done so far. And I've been, there's been albums I thought were bad, but this was the first time I felt bored, like properly bored. Oh, I don't know. We've had this. a few boring ones, haven't we? Mm. There's, been, yeah. there's been a few. I mean, was that Dylan album much more exciting than this? No, but I didn't get actively bored going through it. It was like, okay, I don't, I'm not like I hugely engaged by this, but I wasn't. Maybe just in simple terms, those Dylan songs were shorter. <laughs> so yeah. at least you've got a, oh, this is a new song now. Mm. Whereas these just drag on. Even by the time you've got bored, you're like, oh, I'm bored of this now. And then it's still got another two minutes to go. Like, I don't particularly like his voice either. Oh, I was just about to bring up his voice. I, it I, goes heart. That annoyed me as well. I quite like his voice. I don't mind it, yeah. But yeah, I mean, I'm really, really surprised that this is... Um, highest... Uh, uh, whatever. But <laughs> I'm, highest I'm, 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 list, I, yeah. I am surprised about that. Yeah. Like... The first one was that blew him into stardom. I thought this one, because I mentioned this album to, to somebody yesterday and they knew a lot about Tom Petty, but they didn't speak much about this album. Mm. So I'm surprised that, what, what's Rolling Stone hearing or seeing? Yeah, I Did know. it do well commercially? Not as well as his first album. This is the other interesting thing about this. Normally when I'm doing the research on these, I find some information about what people thought about it and how well it did commercially. There's nothing much written about this album. Which I thought, well, what does that tell me? That's not convincing me that mm. I'm wrong about this. I'm kind of, it's just very little, little there. 
you go to the Wikipedia page for most albums on this list and you'll get extensive mm. notes about sort of production background, commercial reception, critical response, all that kind of stuff. Mm. This one's got virtually nothing. And it felt like that to me. It feels like a, a nothing album. Mm. Yeah. Why is it so high up then? I mean, that's the quote. That should go on your review. Tom Petty's a nothing album. Well, you know, the, the Rolling Stone uh, thing said, it's 70 minutes long, but it doesn't have any filler. And I was like, well, it's all filler, mate. It's all filler. <laughs> 70 minutes. It's got more filler than a plasterer's toolbox. Yeah. I know. <laughs> He's on he fire. liked that one, didn't He's he? He's on fire. Billy just nodded. He went, no more. I'm gonna no keep, more. I'm going to keep that one. Yeah. <laughs> That's a good one. Yeah, just really disappointing, I think, overall. It's like, don't get it. And like I said, the only thing I can think of is that Rolling Stone magazine, like we, we've spoken before about, you know, the people making the list. The list says more about the people making the list than it does about the albums that are on it. Mm. 100%. And this is very indicative of that, I think. <laughs> says a lot more about the Rolling Stone audience than it does about the quality of that album, mm. I yeah. think. Yeah. People have kept saying that this is good. So it's like, oh yeah, Wildflowers by Tom Petty. That's a good one, isn't it? And you've kind of, it's sort of reinforced its own story by people keep saying, yeah, it's a great album, that Tom Petty one. And <laughs> it's like the Emperor's New Clothes. <laughs> have you asked, when was the last time you listened to it? Yeah, mm. yeah. Go and listen to it again. Tell me if you still think it's good. Mm. I think we're kind of all in agreement. Maybe yeah. I think... Uh, I don't think I hated it as much as you. No, not quite. <laughs> I was, was going to say, say that. Yeah. I, feel, I feel like I'm not sort of... Not quite as much. But I think I'm sort of comparing it to like the Dylan ones and Barry Morrison ones, which I really didn't like. And yeah. this one just seems to be a bit better, but mm. also it's a little bit similar as well. I much preferred the Van Morrison one to this. They're on a par for me. It's funny, isn't it? We've actually... We have had so many coincidences and yeah. like things on this podcast in terms of weeks back to what's been happening and we have just had a lot of this sort of Americana mm. country folky bluesy singer songwriter stuff yeah. in the last like four or five weeks yeah. it's coming up a lot maybe it's that generation of America's sort of stuff they, who are voting for it yeah if they love the uh, Bob Dylan stuff they're going to love sort of this sort of stuff aren't they all we need yeah. now is the, we need now is the Eagles for the icing mm. for the oh, show definitely D- Dylan I'm all that week <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, it's interesting. Like I said, maybe we will run into this, and we, uh, we've spoken about this, but maybe we will run into this a lot because of the American bias of the list that you'll have stuff that's very popular in yeah. America that wouldn't necessarily yeah. hit over here. That I'm not sure you would find a Tom Petty album at all, maybe, on if you did, <laughs> no, a, if you did a top 500 albums. I think albums. you would, and I think Free Falling would be on the top sing songs. 20 sing, <laughs> sing songs. Maybe top 20 songs of all time. <laughs> yeah. I think that's such a great song. Yeah. And I think it's, um, yeah, I think it would be up there mm. with his favourite. Yeah, Tom Petty is a very popular artist, but this, I know what you mean. It was just, yeah. it was just bit, bit, bit middle of the road, yeah. bit nothingy, boring. Yeah. And so I, know, and I want to know as well, anyone listening to this podcast who's kind of, you know, go and listen to this album if you haven't listened to it before, or if you're a Tom Petty fan and you love this album, as we've said many times. <laughs> Get your ears challenged, Mark. Well, <laughs> no, tell, wait, you know, seriously, it's all subjective, of course. So tell us why we're wrong. I want to, I want to know. We've got boxing gloves down here. Come um, down and show you know, Martin his I didn't, boss. I didn't like it. I didn't rate it. I feel I can back that up with reasons, not just I didn't like it. Just, like I said, feels like it's just, it, could, it feels like it could have been better. Just for like somebody just arrange these songs a little bit better and push the tempos a little bit and get a better vocal performance, it would actually have to be a bit more engaging. Mm. Don't think it's that Ouch. the songs are terrible. <laughs> oh, <laughs> What's happened? Scathing. <laughs> Fair enough. Honest. That was that was sorry. Uh, audio, a shrug doesn't work on audio. Yeah. Does it? That, was good. that was a big shrug. I feel like we just need a harmonica to sign this off yeah. now. Though. Really <laughs> random <laughs> harmonica. Make a harmonica go. <laughs> 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 All right, to the vote. Let's start with Martin. Yeah. Is he going to go for a zero? No, no, I'm not. I'm going to go for a two. Oh, because I, I mean, it's not a one, is it? What's I, a I one don't again? bother. It can't be. A, I, the great I, twenty-eight I, is a I one. I gave it. Ones, hey. ones the great are, twenty-eight. Ones that don't bother. I mean, one, one, one's a Chuck Berry. Yeah. Um, although you gave that a two, but um, it's yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a two for me because I don't think it's a don't bother. Like I said, I gave it a second listen. And it didn't bug me as much second time round. But I was still aware of getting bored, even though I was kind of listening for a second time. I wasn't, <laughs> didn't have quite such a visceral reaction to a second time round. So I think, you know, if you're into this sort of thing, which is basically what a two is, if you're into Dylan-esque American soft rock stuff and you like Tom Petty, yeah, it's all right, probably. No, I won't yeah, I think I was, was going to give it a three, but then saying that, did I enjoy it? No. So would I recommend it? No. So it's going to be a two. 
I don't think anyone should waste their time on this. That's yeah. the thing. Three yeah. would be, yeah, it's worth a listen. I don't yeah. think it is. No. If you like Tom Petty, yeah, go and check it out. If you're, not, if you're into that sort of stuff. I'd probably give Tom Petty a four as an artist. Yeah. Because I like him. Yeah. And I think he's got some great songs and he's got a good, good voice. But I'm with you, boys. For this album, I'm going to give it a two as well. Mm. Oh, that is, that's poor. He's down three in the depths of. That's got to be real, though. Six. He's down in the depths of the single six figures. For Sorry, Tom, Tom Petty's wildflowers. Try harder next time. Full Tom. Moon Fever will give better. Well, that's on here, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, we'll come back to Tom Petty again. Can't wait. Uh, absolutely. Well, there you go. Just goes to show. Isn't music wonderful? All right. <laughs> Our second album this week is from Nirvana and it is In Utero from September 1993. 13th of September 1993 this was released. And Rolling Stone said, after Nevermind went mega platinum, Kurt Cobain detested how the band had drawn frat boys and homophobe fans. Plankton, he called them, adding, don't come to our shows and don't buy our records. <laughs> Nirvana hired indie rock producer Steve Albini to record their new album, resulting in a record sonically forbidding enough that Geffen Records asked them to clean it up. In Scentless Apprentice, he screams, go away, at no one and everyone, summarising this powerfully unsettling third album. Melodies peek through the clouds of his wrath, especially on All Apologies Dumb and Penny Royalty, but the prevailing mood is queasy like a visit to the inside of Cobain's aching stomach. This was their third and final studio album produced by Steve Albini, uh, but also then remixed later by Scott Litt, especially the singles, I think, single releases. Albini had dismissed Nirvana as R.E.M. with a fuzz box and an unremarkable version of the Seattle sound. However, he accepted the job because he felt sorry for them, perceiving them as the same sort of people as all the small fry bands I deal with, totally at the mercy of their record company. The number one movie in 1993, September 1993, was Striking Distance. Uh, the number one album was Bat Out of Hell 2, Back Into Hell by Meatloaf. And the number one single was Mr. Vane by Culture Beat. September the 10th, The X-Files, created by Chris Carter and starring David Duchovny and Gillian Anderson, made its debut. And on September the 15th, the single I'd Do Anything for Love, But I Won't Do That, sung by Meatloaf and composed by Jim Steinman, was released and goes on to be number one in 28 countries. Well, uh, just whilst we're talking about, just on the fact of the bat out of hell, the top 10 best-selling albums of all time, there are some movie soundtracks on there, and I think there's our greatest hits album on there, mm. but all of the sort of original composition artists mm. and original composition albums that are on there, all of them are in this top 500 list with the exception of one album, which is one of the top 10 best-selling albums of all time and isn't on the Rolling Stone 500 list, and it is Bat Out of Hell by Meatloaf. That's mad. I know. I think we should do it one week. Mm. Just to give that, it that its due. Weird, isn't it? Just put a middle finger up at the Rolling Stone. Mm. Yeah, crazy, isn't it? Why not? Uh, anyway, there you go. In Utero, the third and final studio album by Nirvana. I think familiar to two of us, less familiar to the other. Miles, less familiar I knew Nirvana as much as, um, I wouldn't say I'm a massive fan, but I knew a bit about Nirvana. So no, this is the first time I actually fully studied an album. So this is a weird entry point for Nirvana. It I is. Thought, yeah. And this is, I've got some questions for you too, because I haven't yeah. had, I'm afraid so I didn't what have did you time think? to go back to previous albums. Um, I felt... There's some, melodically, some bits that I thought, oh, that's really nice. But overall, this isn't a bad thing necessarily, mm. but I found it quite uncomfortable to listen to. Mm. But then I also think it's great. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. And I know that sounds weird but, and fairly flippant, but... Um, I suspect that's what they were going for. Y mm. Yeah. I, moreover, it felt like it was an insight into Kurt Cobain's mind mm. and his vulnerabilities and the psychological sort of craziness. I mean, like some of the tunes were pretty uncomfortable, but so my question to you guys is, is this like the most raw out of the, cause I didn't go back and listen to the previous 100%. album. It's is this a, the most raw? It's such a response to Nevermind because they got so big and that album is so commercial and so commercial, but yeah, yeah. there's literally no fillers on it. It's still heavy. There's not, it's not poppy about it, but it's just done so well. There's such good rock songs. And I think they, Especially Kurt Cobain hated being in the limelight and hated being known as just like number one like 
band. So when yeah. you write songs like Tourette's and like Scentless <laughs> Apprentice, and I think like you're talking about the frat boys, they've gone to listen to that to hear another never mind here and like yep. smells like Teen Spirit, and then like the second track on there is that they're gonna be like you. That's like what they do and why they're screaming that. Yeah, I mean the natural yeah. thing for me was like mm, this. What is this? This yeah. isn't my this yeah. isn't my vibe. But then I thought, which brings me to my next question: Is this album bigger because of what happened to to Kurt Cobain? I did this, then make this album bigger because suddenly you think, oh, that's why it was probably. I so think cra- such a crazy album. He was it, going through. It so is much. a crazy album, but still the singles on there. I think Heart Shaped Box is still like I think it's my favorite song though they've done and like Dumb and All Apologies. There's still some yeah, singles uh, on there. there yeah, like, I mean, honestly, some out. of it was some of it was yeah. great, beautiful. Yeah, yeah. it's um, a half and half, isn't it? But it's and kind like, of it's it's quite crazy. It's, it's a crazy album. Yeah, it's a crazy yeah. album. And maybe they wouldn't be as big. We well, haven't covered any of these artists like John Lennon as an example. <laughs> that you kind of cement your legacy yeah, yeah. by not being around anymore. Because yeah. if you've created this kind of body of three albums, yeah. you can't ruin it by coming out with a bad one now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sort of thing. Does that help? And yeah, I think, I think you're right. That sort of um, record labels love dead artists, right? Because yeah. mm. they, they get a sales boost. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah I didn't think The about worst that. one is a bit of a tenuous link. Um, Pat Smear, who joined on this album for the tour, who's like the Foo Fighters guitarist as well, um, he was in a punk band called The Germs. Yeah. Right. And uh, their singer he had the exact same thought. It's like, oh, I'll be I'll be a legend if I die and kill myself. The band will be bigger. So we did that. But only thing is, he killed himself on the same day that John Lennon died. So he basically got no press. <laughs> How awful <laughs> was that? Should, oh, God, he shouldn't yeah. laugh. <laughs> no. Um, that's what I thought. Uh, yeah, that's, um, that's crazy. I mean, like, for example, and, uh, like the Rape Me song. Yeah. I mean, I know it's actually an anti-rape song, but yeah. it imagine like you just that just wouldn't get you wouldn't be able to put no. it on an album now, would no. you? So it's a great it's song, great melody, like, great like guitar like parts, but it's yeah. shocking, isn't it? Where was yeah. it? Was it to get it into Walmart? It's titled on the back of the album "Wafe Me." <laughs> oh, right, because right. they wouldn't stock it with uh, with oh, okay. me, with so there was, me yeah. on the credit on the back. So they changed the, the not, none, nothing else has changed apart yeah. from just yeah. the title. So when you saw it in the shop. But that was, and even then, Kurt Cobain said, they were, I think people were saying they were surprised he agreed to that because he felt strongly about the mm. message. Mm. But he said, look, when I was growing up, that was the only place I could get records was in Walmart. Yeah. So I want to make sure that people have access to my yeah, music. Yeah, fine. And fine. I remember they did, they played like Jonathan Ross or like an American equivalent of it. And uh, they was like, you can't play that song, can't play that song. They did. And to really like fuck with them. Uh, they didn't play it in full, but they played the intro, and yeah, they thought, walk, they thought walk, they was about to press like the cancel button, yeah, like, yeah. and then they went into like hot shape box. And playing the sort of acoustic intro to yeah. rape yeah. me, they're like, yeah. But then they went into come as you are or something. <laughs> but going to your point is like, would it be as big if Kurt Cobain died? I think it's definitely made him bigger. But would this album be on the list if it wasn't for Nevermind either? It would be in my top five hundred because like most of my favorite albums aren't on this type of, uh, top five hundred. But yeah. I don't. I think Nevermind makes this on the list. I think it really? makes it easier to get it on Yeah, right, okay. Because so, yeah. Um, it... Yeah, because what about you, Martin? Because not... ne- Nevermind made them into Nirvana. Didn't yeah. They? So that's, that's who they are. So then you've got... If you come out with this as your second album and then follow it up by Nevermind... I don't know. It's yeah, different. yeah. Your, your question uh, as well, I just wanted to say that obviously the first album was released on Sub Pop and didn't have Dave Grohl on it. Yes. It was a kind of different band. Yeah, as a and four it was a piece much, well. much more... Um, Rough and ready, sort of demo-ish, I suppose. Album. Right. It, was, it was. It was a much more indie, softer, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but they'd, they'd had enough success that the that the that the label put enough money in them to you know get Butch Vig in to produce it, right? And okay. Stuff. So that you know that helped with Nevermind as well. There was obviously enough behind them to go. We want to put something behind this album to make it big. But everybody was taken by surprise. Nobody expected Nevermind to be this the scale that it was. No, uh, but I recorded quite quickly as well. Didn't they? The speed that it happened mm. as well. Again, listen, that reading Dave Grohl's book about this said like none of them expected how fast that was going to happen. No. Smells like Teen Spirit just went mega. Is that like top ten on this album? Yeah, yeah. Is it? Uh, Nevermind's in the top ten. Yeah. So, Martin, I was going to ask you because I know Billy's sort of like into his heavier stuff, but yeah. I've picked up the you're not not necessarily so i wonder what how this compares to nevermind for you personally how it compares to nevermind well sorry and in general and in general but uh, i've sort of be a bit as i was listening i thought mm, I, can't, I can see billy liking this but i'm not sure if martin will but then you were saying yeah. positive things about it last week so i don't know i was nirvana fan when nirvana you know came out that was a big 
deal and it was right up my street. I think I said on this when we were covering the Smashing Pumpkins, I'm surprised that I didn't listen to Smashing Pumpkins at the mm. time because of kind of that mm. sort of period, that sort of genre. It's like, that was sort of my thing right then. Chili Peppers, Nirvana, and I just didn't get Smashing Pumpkins, never went there. So uh, yeah, I was big into uh, Nevermind when that came out, but there was all the, the stuff that was going on around Kurt Cobain around that time as well, uh, that he didn't like that album and that In Utero was going to be very different and there was all the stuff with Kurt. Uh, what, because he felt too commercial? Yeah, I mean, you, you know, that was all known at the time. It wasn't yep. sort of afterwards, that was everything <clears throat> he was saying was, I don't know what we're doing. So you kind of knew In Utero was going to be our response to that. And also there was the stuff with Courtney Love and he was uh, heavy into drugs. And so all the news was around that sort of stuff. So you're getting slightly, okay, what's going to happen with this band? Excited about In Utero coming out. Can't remember. There's a weird sort of sequence in terms of, did they release, I don't think they preceded anything with a, I don't think they even released a single. I don't they think Heart Shaped Shape Box, the I think, was released as a single I think they, they promoted it, but it wasn't actually released as a single. So, so it went to album. radio and stuff like that. Um, but I don't think it actually came out. So you kind of knew the song. You can buy it. Um, so excited about the album coming out. But going back to it now, my memory is, yeah, I had that. I don't think I listened to it very much because mm. it was a bit hard going. Uh, and when are you going to listen to it? So I had it, definitely listened to it, but probably not very often. <laughs> and then probably got put away and gone, yeah. That's a Nirvana album. Yeah. I'm, quite, I'm quite glad I've got that. Mm. I'm probably not going to listen to it very much. Are you still, still for the same? No. That was the fascinating thing about going back to it, was listening to it now and going, shit, this is really, actually, really good. Mm -hmm. Like what, a, I don't know, just kind of respect for the, for the artistry of it and the response of it and the way it's been done uh, and the songwriting. I think... <laughs> Heart Shaped Box and uh, All Apologies particularly, I think they're, they're probably the best Nirvana songs, actually. Mm, wow. They're mm. the most Nirvana, Nirvana. Obviously, they're not the biggest ones, but I think they're actually the best reflection of the best of Nirvana, mm. those two songs. And even thinking about it and reading about it, so sort of listening to it, even, what's the name of the first track? I've forgotten now. Um, it's Apprentice, the first one. Serve the Servants. Serve the, serve the Servants. Do you kind of think, What's your statement about this album? And that's quite heavy, but quite melodic as well. Yeah, yeah that really is an it earwig is melodic. after we'll cool get the end yeah, about yeah, it. it is melodic, yeah, yeah, really good, really good, mm. really good chorus, really good melody. So it's a good entry, really. And then you go Scentless Apprentice. So it's sort of got you ready for that a little bit, but then going, Shit. That's my favourite drum beat of all time. It's cool though, isn't it? Boom, boom, that, boom, even boom. Scentless I love Appre that Because I was listening second, to the second, yeah, second one. Yeah, that drum beat is so like, Scentless Apprentice, yeah. you're going... Firstly, I was well, a couple of things I was thinking, what is he doing with his voice on that? Yeah. I mean, it's an incredible noise he's yeah. making with his voice on that. Yeah. And it's a really hard work song, but it bloody grooves. Mm, yeah. It really grooves. That's like a proper kind of, mm. yeah, man. Yeah. It's got such a vibe about it. So I had that experience going through this album thinking, this is actually much more than I remembered mm -hmm. a really listenable album. Not, like you said, not an easy listen. Mm. But not a kind of, I'm really put off by this kind of, I can't listen to this, it's just noise sort of thing. Uh, which I possibly felt a little bit more, even at the time, that it wasn't quite songy enough for me at the time. But listening back to it now, I'm really glad that I got the opportunity to, or was prompted to go back and listen to it again. Mm. Do you remember where you were when he died? I do. I was on holiday. I had a copy of Q magazine that I'd taken on holiday with me, which I'm pretty sure had huge articles about Kurt Cobain. Uh, and it was on 5th of April, wasn't it? I think that he died. So we were in probably the Canary Islands somewhere. I think you could get newspapers, but they were a day late. So I think we could probably found out a day or two after mm. it had actually yeah. happened because that's when the newspapers arrived. Because this is the days before internet mm. yeah. <laughs> and email and all that kind of stuff. Uh, so we've got the newspapers. So it was really weird because I'd just been reading all about, I don't know, tour in Japan or something like that, I think, or wherever it was. Uh, with Nirvana and then you pick up the paper and go oh he's <laughs> he's dead was it massive yeah. was that everywhere it's front page I think as, yeah. far, as far as I remember it's front page of the paper right? mm. yeah it was huge news wasn't it yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. 27 it club a, right it was, it was a big deal 27, 27 yeah. yeah one of the one of that stupid club 
It's mad. His mum said that he's gone and joined that stupid club. Oh no, it's a great club, I Hendrix. Was, I think that yeah. was his <laughs> great club. No, but like legends, I mean. What did she yeah. mean? <laughs> she she meant oh. people who've killed themselves at twenty seven. Oh right, right. That's what she, right, okay. <laughs> that's what she meant. I thought, and, no. Sorry, because because there there is that uh, bunch of artists that have curiously all died at the same age. Jim Morrison was twenty seven. Yeah, Janis Joplin Jimmy, was Hendrix. Hendrix. Jimmy Hendrix. Jimmy Hendrix was twenty seven. Guy from Manic Street Preachers. Uh, We're yeah, missing. Yeah, they're like legends. Legends. The, well, they are. The Twenty-seven yeah. well, club that's legends. Why I think she said that. That's, that's why I've only that's got two years club left. Club of suicide. Hey, <laughs> that's why I've only got two years left. Get <laughs> right some bangers, mate. Yeah. <laughs> Get but you there. saying like as uncomfortable listen, like and I like heavy stuff. I still found bits like that when he's screaming like in Scentless Sprinters and Tourette's. Yeah. It's not an easy listen at all. No. And like compared to some heavy stuff, because it's the way he's he's not shouting. He's literally screaming. There's no like technique behind it. Where yeah. he's literally it's just like sc- screaming his heart out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's still. Yeah, it's amazing. And I probably haven't listened, probably first heard this album like 10 years ago and it's probably yeah. the first time I've gone back to listen to the whole way through because I love the hits. Like Heart Shaped Box is one of my favourite songs but I was well impressed by it. Like the album tracks. I really like Francis Farmer. I thought it was really cool. Yeah. And um, Tourette's, I know it's probably like the heaviest one on there. I thought, yeah. I want to put my, they used to be my mate's favourite song and we would just like do it at a sound check for gigs. And I was like, oh, how you, can you listen to that song? But the guitar work on it as well, that little riff where they all stop. I think they're just. It is great yeah. song, right? But he's actually a great guitarist as well, and his melodies they really yeah. come through. Yeah, and mm-hmm. it's a band top of the game, really. Yeah. I think I'd written down here the melody, the guitar riff, and the cello on all apologies, pretty perfect. Yeah, <laughs> that's what I wrote there. And they had the perfect sort of career, really, yeah. didn't they? Yeah. It could be like you could split this album half of the really, really heavy stuff and like the melodic stuff. Melodic, yeah, a bit more. Um, yeah. yeah. Yeah, really Great garagey. I, th- I thought the drums, uh, Steve Albini had basically set up 30 microphones in a room to really? record the drums. Yeah. <laughs> so so that, that's, his, that's his technique. So to get, get a nice room, set yeah. up loads of microphones. Yeah. Wicked. Record it's a lot less way. polished than Nevermind as well, isn't it's it? It's more raw, but they wanted yeah. it to be, right? Yeah. It was purposefully more raw. Yeah, and I wondered whether I, I'd like that. I remember we talked about um, the Smashing Pumpkins. That was actually one of the things that put me off was the overproduced, <laughs> mm. like mm. massively layered this is guitars. The opposite. Fine, but I just like felt a little bit much. Mm. Quite like the rawness of this. I think that appealed to me. Switch on the amps and record sort of vibe. The energy mm. sound of it. Yeah, apparently, uh, I think I read Kirk Ben did his vocals for this album in six hours. Well, like one day, six hours. Wow, the whole lot. I bet he would have done those screams so at the end, surely. Fast. There's a great, you can, uh, I've got a copy of it somewhere if, if you're interested. Mm. There's a copy you can find of the um, fax <laughs> letter that Steve Albini sent to uh, Kurt Cobain saying about, look, if we're going to do this, this is how I'm going to do it. And really? he kind of sets out his whole ethos mm. of uh, recording production and how he wants to do the album, which I pretty much almost entirely agree with. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah. Let's get good songs and record yeah. them, basically. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, but <laughs> normally the idea to Have you seen the album, classic right? albums where they just like do like documentary and like yeah. they've done like Nevermind and Metallica and all bits like that? When they did it with Butch Vig, he used to go to like, um, to get like, cause he used to love layering his guitar and his vocals, like double tracking. He said, oh, I didn't press record there. Can you do it again? Oh, I made a mistake here. And he did it perfect the whole time, but he used to have like double track of vocals, four guitar parts. And that's why Nevermind sounds so big. Yeah. And this yeah. is probably just how the band actually sounds. And it's just a lot yeah. more raw. Yeah, 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 yeah. Although there is a, there is a sort of sub, uh, subscript to this. Which is that Kirk Cobain actually didn't like some of the production on this, uh, and it was largely at his request that the uh, that Scott Litt was bro- brought in to remix uh, the singles because he said they could, the vocals were too and the vocals on the bass were too muddy and indistinct, mm. so he wanted those sort of repolished, remastered, so that the vocals were a bit clearer. Uh, and that that was, that was part of Steve Albini's mix process was he like he liked the vocals kind of in quite bedded into the mix. Into the mix. He wanted them pushed up a little bit. Steve Albini apparently got quite upset <laughs> about <laughs> being remixed because um, that was one of the things that he said we should never do in his facts message. Um, in the biography, come as you are, uh, a guy called some somebody Azarad, I can't remember his name. Um, in contrast to Bleach and Nevermind, the lyrics were more focused. They're almost built on themes. Azarad asserted that the lyrics were less impressionistic and more straightforward than previous Nirvana songs <coughs> and noted that virtually every song contains some image of sickness and disease. In Time magazine, Christopher John Farley said in his review, despite the fears of some alternative music fans, Nirvana haven't gone mainstream. 
though this potent new album may once again force the mainstream to go Nirvana. Mm. Um, writing <laughs> in plugged in. What uh, great lines. Yeah. <laughs> That's such a good line. Yeah. Uh, writing in plugged in reviewer Bob Walazduski was less impressed. He said, "In utero is noxious noise with no redeeming value." Well, it yeah. toes the line. <laughs> it does toe the line. So he I didn't think. like it as much. Did, did you? Did you? Well, you kind of said this already. Do you know some of it was like not un, not un, it's uncomfortable, really. not unlistenable. But I, but then I thought, am I sticking with this because of what went on to happen to Kurt yeah. Cobain? Mm. Um, so am I now? Is that why I'm now listening to? If if he was yeah. still around, they were still making albums. Would I be like, what is this tune? Do you know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. yeah suddenly, yeah, really music becomes that. like you said about John Lennon. That suddenly you, the music takes a different sort of meaning because you're like, oh, what, yeah. you know, what do they mean by that? Or, yeah. or, or slightly yeah. different from John it's Lennon. Still, Phil Lennon's last album is you know highly regarded now, I think, but it's definitely not his best work. Mm. Yeah. Um, but I would say this probably is amongst the. Uh, you know, I think this is a pretty good representation of everything that. Kurt Cobain was about and everything that Nirvana was about. They yeah. obviously did release an album that was recorded after this, which was... Um, oh, did they? The, uh, I thought this yeah, was their unplugged, final. The, the, the Unplugged. Oh, okay. Um, which was recorded after this. They've got an album of B-sides as well, in yeah. Incest Times. That's got my favorite. Oh, I'm saying that. Uh, what's it called? Aneurysm, which is a B-side. I think it's one of their best songs. Yeah. Um, but yeah, but what's going, what's going to say was obviously they, they did that afterwards and the interesting thing is there's tracks from this on it but obviously a completely different take on them because they're mm. largely acoustic mm. they're yeah. quite yeah. stripped back and one of the sort of commentators about this had said it'd be interesting to see whether Kirk, how Kurt Cobain might have developed into a sort of almost a folk rock artist rather than a mm. sort of heavy artist whether whether that would have been a path for him I, think I don't know you know <laughs> le, le, like said legendary status we're 30 yeah. years on now mm-hmm. um, from this um, so it's like finding iconic status a new audience all the time yeah and certainly it's probably the first time i've listened to it in 25 years yeah <laughs> so as you said it's not kind of a oh yeah i'm definitely uh a fan of in utero because he died last year mm. it's me listening to it now and going do you know what this is this is my kind of thing i like mm. this a lot i it could be the like best representation because it's so raw and yeah, it's yeah. just the three of them in a room whereas the other one was like overdubbed and yeah it's perfect. quite polished isn't it as yeah. well uh, and there's yeah those singles are so much more um well maybe because, maybe i'll just think of this because they did become widely commercial but this felt completely different this felt mm. Mm. to repeat again this felt mm. just really raw like they mm. just you know switched on and, and started recording and, and it felt like this was a you know you were stepping into the mind of kurt cobain yeah and all his we definitely had one eye on that. There's not you've not lost that commercial aspect of it. There's still tunes in here. There's still singles in here. Mm. There are. Not, I say there's not, some. It's not, it's not a complete kind of fuck you to the music business. I think there's, there's some. There's definitely though. an eye on kind of whether it's intentional or not. He's got commercial appeal in there. Like so definitely, you got, you got um, heart shaped box. Rate me is probably quite catchy, all dumb, and all apologies. That's four like well known tracks of yeah, there yeah, as well, Penny, isn't it? Penny royalty as well. Yeah. Was uh, I think they were that was the single they were about to release when he died, and they pulled it. I think they eventually released it. Uh, actually, because we're ju- we've just passed record store day, haven't we? I think they released it in two thousand and fourteen for twenty thirteen. Twenty thirteen for record store day in twenty thirteen. Uh, to the vote. I'm a fan. I think. Cool, uh, I've got you, to say. You start the five. Vote. Absolute, five. Absolute five. Storm absolute five. Storm five. I was gonna give it a four. You gonna give it a four? Yeah. I'm giving it a three. That's unusual that we've been that split, you know? Mm. Everyone's given it a different one. Twelve. It's still up there, isn't it? It's up there. Oh, I think yeah, it's a solid yeah, twelve. Yeah. Twelve's a good result. And so. I can I can understand why it would split split the vote, uh, definitely. I didn't go into this thinking I would give it a five. Mm. But um Yeah. It's better than Tom Petty, isn't it? <laughs> Thank God. So we what we had a six and a twelve. Are they and they're only a year apart and that that scene at the time as well. Yeah, so heavy and yeah, you know. and like you said, within within that year, like you've had in utero comes out, Kurt Cobain dies, mm. and within that same twelve month period, Dave Grohl's getting asked to play drums for Tom Petty yeah. and the Heartbreakers. It's okay. nuts. Mm. It's a good book. It's obviously um, oh, it's great. A, a I've different, read it. A different really read now because I read it just before uh, Taylor Hawkins died. Mm. So it's, it takes on a whole sort of different context now. Reading about that because of the way he talks about um, his relationship with Taylor Hawkins, but he also talks about how he was affected by uh, Kurt Cobain's death as well. Because he basically, I think, I think I'm right in the way he said this. He said, I'd, I'd already, he'd already died once. 
So when he did actually die, like in his mind, because he'd, he'd had he'd been told that he died from a heroin overdose. I think he'd had a, taken a heroin overdose when they were in Japan Rome. or, or two or somewhere. Yeah. And at that point, they were like, he's gone, mate. Mm. And he'd actually got a telephone call saying, we've lost him. Mm. He thought that was it. And he said he had this complete reaction to Kurt Cobain dying mm. and then found out he hadn't. Mm. So he said when he actually did, he couldn't quite process it because mm. he'd already had the reaction mm. <laughs> it was like no, I don't know what to do with the, with the emotions tough story we will come back to Nirvana two more times we'll come two back to Nirvana time. on this list yeah. let's get the random number generator to tell us what we're going to do next time <laughs> 468 oh we only just got in there it's our old friends the Rolling Stones oh. and uh, it is their album Some Girls released on 9th of June 1978 good on the drummer? The one. That's the one with Miss You on it, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, Miss You. Two, four, three. Can we have two? Four, okay, three? sorry. Our second number was, Billy, you said. Two, it. four, three. We had that one for Tom Petty. I think that was two, four, three. Oh, no, it was two, fourteen. Two, fourteen. Yeah. Oh. Two, four, three. We have a 200. Well, good. Well, you remembered, though. Do you know what? This is the first time this has happened. Oh, it, almost wow. des- it almost deserves a round of applause. Who is it? <laughs> the, so, the num- previous number was an, an artist that we've already had before. Yeah. We have done this one before. Yeah. Our ah. random number generator has randomly uh, come back with Odyssey and Oracle by the Zombies. Should we do it which again? we've already done. Well, shall we, yeah, shall no, we listen quite good. We like the see, Zombies, yeah. Shall we listen and, again and see what we thought? Ooh, got a higher one. <laughs> so, we'll have to redo the number. We haven't had to do that before. So 29. Ooh. Oh, okay, that's, that's going to be a different story. This couldn't have worked out better, guys. Who is it? Number 29 is the Beatles. Yeah. <laughs> Martin's rigged it. Martin's rigged it. <laughs> no, Martin's no. rigged it. It's not really zombies. <laughs> what, I, what I meant was... <laughs> what we've, album? Got, we've got the Rolling Stones and the Beatles. Yeah. Uh, this is The Beatles by The Beatles, which is more commonly known as The White Album. Oh, okay. cool. Great. The Rolling Stones and the How Beatles on the same. Martin? Randomly, we've got the Rolling Stones and the Beatles on the same show. I like that. Well. How happy are you, Martin? Be honest. Well, there's night. <laughs> I'm surprised we haven't had the Beatles already. To be honest, oh, true. Um, they're the most in featured the artists. USSR. Yeah, by by uh, some margin. The t- the top two artists featured are the Beatles and Bob Dylan. While my guitar uh, gently weeps with numbers. Cool. Well, look forward to that. Rolling Stones versus the Beatles. It was always a kind of a, you're one or the other, I think. was mm. That was one of those things at the time. But we're, we're unfortunately, unfortunately we're, we're, ten, we're, ten years, <laughs> we're 10 years apart. I wasn't around at the time for either of them. Though, but, uh, this is all afterwards. I've seen, I've seen one I think it's been fairly clear up to now that I quite like the Beatles and I don't have much time for the Rolling Stones. <laughs> I'm prepared to be convinced. <laughs> I just haven't heard one yet. I haven't heard a convincing argument yet. As far as I'm concerned, so far... Rolling Stones, great singles, great but, li- great live band as well. So people say. <laughs> <laughs> have you have you seen them, Bill? No. I saw them at Twickenham. Very good. Uh, looking forward to that. Thank you, boys. Thank you. Always fun. Uh, thank you to Miles Mitchell. Thank you very much, Martin. Martin. I look forward to next week. Really very much. woke up during that. You started off with no energy. I know. But you came, you came back strong, man. Thank you, you very much. Should be hung over more often. Uh, I know. And, uh, my other tremendous co-host, Billy Hills. Thank you. Hillsy. Hillsy. Uh, Hillsy. Hillsy. Uh, me, Martin Lumsden. This Lumsdy. Has been, Lumsdy. <laughs> this has been the Apollo Audio Podcast. Do the like and subscribe thing if you're listening <laughs> along. Subscribe. Uh, click below. Subscribe, click below. That doesn't work, does it? No, it doesn't yeah, okay. click, click somewhere, wherever the button is. Uh, leave us a rating, leave us a message. Uh, if you're listening to the albums, we'd love to know what you think of them. You can get in touch at apolloaudiopod at gmail.com. See you next time. Bye. 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 Will you forgive me?